right. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I love all of your uh, quotes about the future. I Another favorite of mine is that you can uh, make a prediction or you can pick a date, but you should never make a prediction and attach a date to it. Um, so I will make a prediction right now, which is that we will have another recession, but I'm not going to tell you when that recession is coming. Can I just sure, of course. Great. So um, since there are a lot of historians here, I thought that I would try to say something about the next recession by looking at the last one. Uh, so nothing about the Great Recession was small. Uh, the economy lost about 9 million jobs, or at one point about uh, 772,000 jobs on a monthly basis. Household uh, wealth tumbled um, by about uh, 20 per oh, sorry. Uh, household net worth tumbled by about 21%. Home prices tumbled by 30%, um, even more so in some areas, particularly in this part of the country, Nevada, Utah, California. Um, in all, about 9 million people lost their jobs. Um, by some indicators, is it possible, I'm so sorry, is it possible? Yes, okay. Is it possible also to make this bigger? I can't read <laughs> what's in front of me at all. Thank you so much. Sorry, that's okay. My mouse has disappeared. Oh, there it is. That's so much better. Thank you. <laughs> um, so some initial shocks were actually worse than the Great Depression. Home prices tumbled by more. The S&P tumbled by more. And on a nominal basis, um, household net worth tumbled by more than in the Great uh, Depression. So what does this mean for the states? I'm a Californian, so I often look to California, my home state, which was notorious for having late budgets, although many other states have caught up, in particular uh, uh, Illinois, which I think went for about two years without a budget um, and accumulated about $18 billion in unpaid bills. Um, but California had a uh, problem passing a budget in the summer of 2008. So the state is supposed to have a budget um, by June 30th, and the fiscal year starts on uh, July 1st. They actually went to September 23rd with no budget. And there were protests in Sacramento. Uh, you know, students actually wanted more funding for higher education. Public employee unions wanted something else. There was a lot of back and forth. Finally, they passed a budget 100 days late, and then they were basically back at the drawing board in November because revenue forecasts went, uh, revenues came in about $24 billion below forecast, and by December it was another $7 billion below that. So the economy just went south by every measure, whether it was GDP, uh, non-farm employment, or personal income. Um, so there's a saying by Wallace Stegner that California is just like the rest of the country, but only more so, and that's exactly what was happening in the Great Recession. All states were losing revenue. So income taxes fell by about 15.5%. Sales taxes actually were the first to fall, although income taxes fell by more. Sales taxes fell, fell by about 5%, and especially for durable goods or sort of big ticket items, which bring in a lot of revenue to states. Um, so this was greater than in, uh, in the previous recession in the early 2000s, um, and not like anything that states had seen since the Great Depression. So in all, about 41 states had to do what California did and come back to the drawing board, sometimes multiple times, to draft a new budget, finding spending hikes or revenue, um, uh, spending cuts or revenue hikes to close their gap between what was coming in and what they had thought was going to be coming in. Um, and all states uh, lost about 30% of the revenues that they expected and had deficits they had to close because unlike the federal government, um, states are supposed to balance their books, although there are many ways in which they can get around those requirements, as I'll talk to you in a little bit. But this was a serious emergency for states. By the way, I'm drawing on the wonderful National Conference of State Legislators here, and I understand we have a representative from that organization, so thank you for all of your good work. I've been wanting to tell you I'm a huge fan. Um, so states do have these rainy day funds or savings, um, but their savings weren't enough. So basically, the darker blue colors are the good uh, metrics in these maps, and you can see there are fewer dark blue states as we go through the recession. So something like 23 start states started with rainy day funds that were in pretty good shape. So the rule of thumb is that you have something like 5% of your usual spending saved. No one knows where that rule of thumb came from. Um, but some states actually had quite a bit more saved, but nothing could have prepared them for revenue losses on the order of 30%. Um, so by the, the tail end of the recession, it was more like 13 states that had rainy day funds that were in good shape. 
So why is this a problem? As I said, states and localities, unlike the federal government, are bound to balance their books each year. There are differences in the stringency of those requirements. So the least stringent are the ones that say at the beginning of the fiscal year, your revenues and spending have to be balanced, which is very easy to do. At the beginning of the year, I can say, you know, my household is going to have a balanced budget this year. The real test is whether at the end of the year you're allowed to roll over your debt into the next fiscal year. Um, so those more stringent rules um, prevent states from doing that. But even then, the rules apply to general fund budgets and not necessarily um, federal funds or special funds that are earmarked for things like transportation. Um, and states can do things like rely on gimmicks to balance their budgets. So famously, um, Arizona sold its state capital and then leased, its, it leased it back. So it incurred this future obligation um, even though it looked like on paper they had balanced their budget. I already referred to Illinois, which balanced its budget by just not paying its vendors, and that affected uh, nonprofits that provided services to low-income communities, universities, other kinds of contractors with the states. But in principle, states have to balance their budgets, and credit rating agencies notice that they don't, and people are generally loath to lend to states who try to borrow to keep the lights on rather than building bridges and building uh, capital investments. So states, therefore, have to either raise taxes or cut spending. Um, but the problem is that those actions can work against a national economic recovery. You generally want people to have more money in their pockets to go out there and spend to combat the recession. And this has been a problem that economists have been aware of for quite a while. Um, they call it fiscal perversity. And some people say that it actually prolonged the Great Depression, as well as Japan's lost decade in the 1990s. So there were a whole host of, pol of policy responses. I'm not going to get into this too much, but there were a lot of monetary policy actions. Uh, that were taken, um, truly a massive response. And then on the fiscal side, you have both the Bush and the Obama administrations trying to stabilize the housing, auto, and financial sectors, as well as uh, housing markets. But the biggest and most recognizable response was the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. This was about $800 billion. Uh, it was basically evenly distributed, a third, a third, a third, tax cuts, um, spending increases, and investments. Um, and some of the tax cuts were things that would have been undertaken anyway, like relief from the alternative minimum tax. Um, but this was the, the biggest response, and it was controversial. Uh, this is actually someone I know, GED, is um, Ed Desev, who is a wonderful public servant but was sort of mocked on Stephen uh, Colbert because one thing the Recovery Act did was it really tried to establish this precedent of transparency. So they had a database where you could track spending at a very micro level, what the government had said it would spend and how much it was already spending. Um, and it turns out that there were some districts that were coding errors that were just the wrong numbers. And so this was uh, mocked on national television. Um, and people in polling generally found the stimulus to be unattractive, but among economists, um, this uh, lower corner is a poll of um, economists that the Chicago uh, Business School undertakes. And about half of economists said that they thought that it was a good thing to do. Um, but I want to argue to you that actually one of the biggest misconceptions about the stimulus was that it was federal. One thing that people don't realize is that half of every spending dollar that came through the stimulus went through or to state and local governments. So it might have been money that eventually ended up in the pockets of people who were directly affected by the recession, people who lost their jobs, but it still was touched by people in state capitals or in city halls. And then of that amount, about half of it went directly to state governments to help balance their budgets to prevent them from um, cutting services and doing things that federal policymakers thought would prolong the recession. So there's evidence that, that this was successful. Um, a lot of people make uh, a lot of hay of the fact that really there's no counterfactual. There's no treatment and comparison group that you can look at in a recession. But you can look at um, what happens in states based on the timing when uh, they actually got payments. And you did see um, some positive effects on employment, although they tapered out. And there's a lot of uncertainty around these estimates. Um, there's also some evidence that aid went to the states that had the biggest budget gaps. So this was good for fiscal stabilization or keeping a constant flow of surfaces, as well as economic stabilization or putting money into the hands of people who needed it, either by giving them money uh, through benefits or not raising taxes on them at a bad time. Um, so where are things now? Um, the state and local sector is contributing to economic growth again. So on average, the state and local sector contributes a third of a percentage point to average annual GDP growth. They're the biggest employer, bigger than manufacturing, bigger than retail. Um, so it matters how the sector is doing in terms of the overall economy. And for a while, they were a drag on economic growth, but they're now contributing positively again. But employment remains depressed, about 1% below where it was before the recession started at the peak. 
Um, and these uh, declines actually are concentrated in state non-education services, so things like the DMV. So state education has rebounded. That's mainly higher education. But, um, and I don't, I don't know what the right level of public employment is. The question is whether there is a, a reduction in the services people are getting, whether, whether productivity increases have made up for this. Um, but th the question is really whether voters notice and, and um, take out their anger at the ballot box. Revenue growth also has been slow in keeping with our weak economic recovery. So in about half of all states, their revenues are still at um, below recession, pre-recession levels on a real per capita basis. Um, revenues are up most recently because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act at the federal level, um, but there's some question about whether that's because people are accelerating their income um, and uh, realizing quick gains that they're not necessarily going to be lasting. Um, also, an interesting point is that the TCGA created a lot of decision points for states, especially a place like Utah, where they have an income tax that is very closely aligned with federal definitions of income, including personal exemptions. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act nearly doubled the standard exemption that you take if you don't itemize, but it eliminated the value of personal exemptions. So this means if you're an individual, uh, then you can get quite a big tax cut. Um, but if you lose your personal exemptions, if you have more than two kids, if you've got three or four kids, um, then you have a tax increase. So what some states are doing is actually passing, um, and I think Utah actually has already done this, passing more generous child tax credits to try to keep these families whole. So the, the point is that even if states are getting a revenue windfall, as some people has, have said, that's also kind of a political headache because you have to decide, do you want those revenues when you're basically increasing taxes on large families? Um, but there's also this backdrop of, backdrop of sort of unfinished business for state and local governments. Um, we've got an economy that's moving from a mainly uh, goods-dominated um, form of consumption to services. So people used to buy lawn mowers, now they pay someone to mow their lawns, and states don't tax those transactions. You've got the aging of the population, you've got rising health care costs, a lot of things that are affecting the federal government that are also affecting states and localities, and that were problems before the recession hit and are still problems now, but in a time of perhaps uh, long-standing um, weak job growth and weak income growth, this could be a big problem. So what's next? Um, well, there have been recurring proposals for the federal government to basically do what it did in the last recession on an ongoing basis. And I want to say there are antecedents where they've done this before in the 70s and 80s. Um, the trick is getting the timing right. Um, so with the uh, response to the previous recession in 2001, aid didn't start to flow until after the recession was already over. In some cases, it just takes a long time for legislators to make decisions. In some cases, it takes a long time to cut the checks. The Recovery Act actually did better on a timeliness measure. Um, but the question is, you know, is there some better way to prepare the state and local sector? So some people have argued that there should be a national rainy day fund. Rather than these individual state funds, you should have a pooled fund that states contribute to. And if you draw on the fund more, then you have to pay a higher premium, just like any other kind of insurance. Um, maybe you have something like a 401k for states where there are some employers where they match your contributions to try to incentivize you to stay save. So maybe you have something like that. Maybe you have loans or advances on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, which is certainly something that Governor Schwarzenegger argued for and was rebuffed. Um, we had general revenue sharing, which are these unrestricted grants at some point in American history, and they didn't last for very long. There are other federations, as I think came up in the last panel, where that's more common, but that's never been uh, very popular in the United States. And part of that is because there's always this problem of moral hazard. So moral hazard is basically the problem that if I have insurance, I'm more likely to undertake risky activities that will cause me to use that insurance um, because I know that I'm not going to be the one paying for it. Um, so there are solutions to moral hazard in the economics literature. One is tagging or conditioning aid on things that you can observe that are not easy to manipulate. So basically giving people aid if they, as an individual, are blind or disabled. Um, so in a state uh, context, this would mean something like uh, looking at the unemployment rate, which is hard to manipulate if you're a governor, whereas you can pretty easily drive your budget into the ground. Um, another mechanism is called ordeal mechanisms, and I was speaking about this to um, some state officials, and a woman who was formerly, the, I think, the head of the Department of Transportation in a state kind of chortled because for her, that's all that dealing with the federal government is. Um, but creating a lot of reporting and paperwork, um, you know, is one way to increase accountability, like that Ed DeSev example I showed you with the database, but it also means that if you're a state, you're not going to apply for aid unless you really, really, really need it to go through that hassle. 
Um, so in some ways, the Recovery Act fulfilled those suggestions. There was an increment, a, a bump up in the Medicaid reimbursement rate that was tied to local economic conditions, that was tied to the unemployment rate. And then there was this extensive reporting, which was really for transparency and good government kind of stuff, um, but also could deter fraud and um, could be a way of preventing states from uh, asking for assistance if they didn't truly need it. So going forward, there's all kinds of questions about how you'd actually set it up. What would be the trigger? What would be the unemployment rate that you look at? Is it a state level? Is it a combination of several states? Is it based on an average? Is it based on some potential value? And then how do you target funds? This is a huge problem in federalism. There's a tendency to want to take a given pot of money and spread it very thinly rather than targeting it to the places that are most in need because basically, you know, I was in government very briefly, but if you're going to have an event uh, at the White House, you want to have a big event with a lot of people instead of just a few people. Um, so how to get there from here? Um, general revenue sharing, as I said, is a tough sell, mainly because the federal government, after going through the work of raising revenue, although it was pointed out earlier, they in some ways have a monopoly that they have this fantastic income tax, although states have very effectively piggybacked off that income tax by using the same definitions of income, or AGI, for example. Um, but say that the federal government does all this work raising revenue, which it can do because it's very hard to evade taxation by leaving the country, whereas if you're a city or a state, people can just go across boundaries to uh, avoid paying taxes. Um, so once they've done that, they are loath to actually give that money to state and local governments uh, without knowing where it's going to go. Um, so rather than flexible aid, you might want to use existing formulas, and like I said with Medicaid, just give a bump up in a recession based on places that are having a bad time economically. You could do the same thing with highway grants. Um, the only problem with that is that our federal formula grants are basically broken. Money is not going to where uh, it's supposed to go. They're often based on criteria that are out of date, like substandard housing um, based on a metric that uh, no longer applies and could actually be going to places that are uh, very... Um, uh, marketable that have beautiful, you know, exposed brick and that sort of thing that are not necessarily places that you um, need uh, federal dollars. Um, and ideology really matters. Um, in the Recovery Act debate, um, there was a case where basically Maine stood to get more money, um, and actually, you know, um, Susan Collins uh, voted her principles and said that she really thought that money for school aid did not belong in a federal package. Um, so you have to sort of think about how to maintain a coalition. Um, and so in some ways, uh, you know, it makes sense to have automatic stabilizers so that the federal government ha doesn't have to get together and decide this in the heat of a crisis um, to figure out what to do now um, before the future arrives. Um, but given the difficulty of targeting, given the difficulty of coming up with the right formula, we might have to settle for something like the second best, which is just a population-based measure where you just give more money uh, on a per capita basis to states. So thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation.